In 2004, analyzing data from the Wilkinson probe, astronomers discovered an anomaly in the constellation Eridanus. For some unknown reason, in an area of incredible size, temperature was well below the average temperature in space. This phenomenon has been called the Eridanus supervoid because from one of its edges to the other, you could line up about 20,000 galaxies like the Milky Way. Recall that it takes 100,000 years for light to travel from one edge of our galaxy to the other. Supervoid, Eridanus, so does not fit into modern cosmological models that among the explanations for its appearance, sounds version that it is the imprint of another universe, which divided with our universe at the stage of its birth. Let's move to 2008. A group of astronomers led by Alexander Kashlinsky found evidence of a general concerted movement of at least 1,400 galaxy clusters towards somewhere outside the visible universe. This is despite the fact that, according to standard cosmological models, the motion of galaxies in space should be random. The phenomenon was called dark flow by analogy with dark matter and dark energy. Again, this was so unexpected that Kashlinsky, commenting on the potential discovery, said, at the moment, we don't have enough information to see what it is or to define it in any way. We can only say with certainty that somewhere very far away, the world is very different from what we see here. Whether it's a different universe out there or a different fabric of space-time, we don't know. In 2023, in the journal, Nature publishes a paper according to which, in the images of the new orbiting observatory, James Webb detected six objects at once, which kind of should not exist. Since the Big Bang passed 13.8 billion years, and these objects were formed 600 million years after the Big Bang. So this is such a fairly early period in the life of our universe. We're talking about six galaxies, six huge galaxies, and absolutely no one understands how such giants could have formed in such an early universe. Because, according to existing models, these galaxies should be at least 10 times smaller, and in a good way, and even 50 times smaller. Calculations show that, at that time, there simply should not have existed so much ordinary matter, the one of which consists of stars, planets, and our bodies to so quickly formed so many stars. One of the study's authors, Erica Nelson, said, If even one of these galaxies is real, it would put an end to our understanding of cosmology. We have not yet seen any explanation for this phenomenon, but people in the discussions are already joking that, Apparently, it is necessary to introduce the concept of dark time, which provokes the accelerated development of cosmic structures. In each of the above cases sounds the same phrase. The discovery has called into question the postulates of our cosmological model. If all of the above is confirmed, if it is not about the imperfection of our observational methods, if the scientists are nowhere wrong, it will mean a crisis of our theories about the cosmos, and that's a good thing. Crises are harbingers of scientific revolutions, but in spite of such mishaps, which happen in science all the time, cosmologists continue to write the word universe with a capital letter in their theories about the universe, and this is not about grammar at all. Let's try to understand what in theory can be beyond the boundaries of the universe. That is, is there any boundary at all to which we could fly and beyond which we could look? Is that what happens if we just start moving toward any point on the celestial sphere? Will there ever be an end to that motion? And if it does, what will it look like? Will we hit a black wall, or will we pass through it? And if we do, where do we go? The question of what lies beyond the boundaries of the cosmos has plagued humans for millennia. Much of the cosmology of the past has been concerned with the center and edge of the universe. For example, this 19th century engraving supposedly depicts how people in the Middle Ages imagined the edge of the universe, beyond which lies the mechanism that controls the universe. It is clear that, if we take a huge telescope and try to see what is in the deep space, we will see not the edge of the universe, but its conventional beginning. It is a hackneyed truth that when we look at the person at the next table, we see him as he was three nanoseconds ago. When we look at the star Betelgeuse, we see it as it was half a thousand years ago. It may have already exploded. The largest galaxy in our local cluster, the Andromeda Galaxy, which is hurtling straight toward us at about 400,000 kilometers per hour, for the same reason, is actually a full 900 light years closer to us than it appears. That's a lot. For comparison, the closest star to the sun is 4.24 light years away, but even to it, with modern technology to fly a few tens of thousands of years. It's generally understandable. You can't just look at something and see it in real time. The farthest place that we can observe is, roughly speaking, the place from where light has had time to travel since the Big Bang. That's the boundary of the observable universe, and it doesn't interest us at all, because beyond that boundary, 
the cosmos almost certainly continues. We want to find a real boundary, not just a visible and conventional one, and we found. It was a long way about the main stages of which you will learn now, but most importantly, our search led us to the book Edward Harrison, Cosmology, The Science of the Universe. It made it clear that perhaps our question itself was fundamentally flawed, even if the boundary really exists, and even if you learn about it at the end of the video. The book is old. The author is no longer alive. Edward Harrison was Professor Emeritus of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Massachusetts, whose merits could be enumerated at length. An extremely well-read man who was clearly drawn to the history of an idea. The author constantly refers to poetry, classical history, or philosophy, illustrating a point of physics or cosmology in a way that is vivid for the general reader. But what strikes me most, Harrison is not afraid to touch on bottomless philosophical questions at all. And at the end of each chapter, he reflects with the reader and asks questions. This doesn't seem like something you'd find in a school textbook after a paragraph test. Your knowledge, rather, not really. More often it looks like if you and a friend at home are having a conversation without fear of sounding ridiculous. For example, many persons, such as materialists and reductionists, overwhelmed by the grandeur of the physical universe, believe that what is not contained does not exist. What do you think? How's that for a question from a recognized cosmologist? and you sit there thinking, what's a decent society to ask such questions? You can easily find the book in the public domain. In general, from the height of the knowledge accumulated by mankind, we can admire as much as we like what is depicted on this very engraving, which you have already seen at the beginning of the video. But as it turns out, it is unlikely that we will ever be able to go far away from the people of the Middle Ages in our understanding. You'll soon be convinced of that. Have you ever wondered what would happen if you just took a large group of people, put them on a huge spaceship and sent it off in one single direction in an attempt to get to the edge of the universe and have the flight happen as fast as possible? In the most detailed and exciting way possible, Columbia University astronomer David Kipping answered this question in a half-hour video. So, let's imagine that a ship can infinitely accelerate at a rate of 10 meters per second in a second. In addition to the constant acceleration, as an added plus, the passengers would feel as if they were being affected by normal Earth gravity. The bottom of the ship will be pushing the crew the same way the Earth is constantly pushing us. Aren't you sick of that, by the way? As you may recall, the acceleration of free fall on Earth is 9.8 meters per second in one second. That is, in the first second, the ship will be moving at 10 meters per second, in the second 20, in the third 30, and in an hour, it will be 35,280 meters per second, and so on. In 2.5 hours, the ship will whiz past the moon, in a week past Saturn, in 11 days past the farthest planet in the solar system, Neptune. We will set aside conventions, such as how the ship has so much fuel, or that at such speeds unsolvable problems would arise, even if it were to collide with, for example, cosmic dust. For the sake of our mental experiment, we can ignore all that. After 15 months of travel, the ship would overcome its first light year, and here would begin the weirdness, because at such a speed more and more strongly come into play the effects of the special theory of relativity. For starters, nothing prohibits a ship from accelerating infinitely, but at the same time, a massive object, like our ship, cannot reach the speed of light. You can approach it as close as you like, but you can't reach it. For example, protons at the Large Hadron Collider are accelerated to speeds of 299,792,455 meters per second. It would seem that just another 3 meters per second, and the speed of light would be reached. 3 meters per second is about the speed of jogging. Even if you expend all the energy in the universe to add protons those 3 meters per second, it would come very, very close to the speed of light. But it won't reach it. In general, if it were not for this limitation, the ship at this acceleration would overcome the speed of light in 45 days. But what actually happens is this. The special theory of relativity tells us that the faster you move in space, the slower you move in time. Because of this, some not particularly intuitive things will happen in the situation we're describing. As the speed of the ship approaches the speed limit, it will appear to an outside observer that the acceleration of the ship is dropping and the people inside are moving as if in ever-increasing slow motion. But from the perspective of the people on the ship, time would be running normally and the acceleration would be unchanged. In addition to the people on the ship, it will appear to the people outside the ship that time has accelerated. 
If it weren't for the laws of special relativity, the ship would travel the speed of light in 45 days. But in fact, after 15 months of flight, it would be traveling at only 87% of the speed of light. The slowing down of time as we approach the speed limit is not uniform. It's like this. So even accelerating up to half the speed of light, the time dilation is barely perceptible. Accelerating up to 90% of the speed of light, you will get time dilation only about two times. And the real extreme begins only when you approach the speed of light almost closely. For example, on October 15, 1991, a particle called Oh My God flew to us from space. Its energy was comparable to the energy of a baseball moving at 93.6 kilometers per hour. This particle was traveling at this speed as a percentage of the speed of light. But the interesting thing is that for it, time was slowed down 300 billion times compared to a stationary observer. That means that for us, a stationary observer, it would have traveled from the Andromeda galaxy for 2.5 million years. But for her, subjectively, it would have been less than five minutes. It turns out that for light itself, which travels at the speed of light, time stops completely altogether. I hope you've grasped the principle. Now, let's think about what that means. And what it means is that traveling far away at close to the speed of light is a kind of making a deal with the devil. If our ship decided to simply fly to the Andromeda galaxy and return back to Earth, then, omitting details with turns and decelerations, 56 years would pass subjectively for the travelers, while 5 million years would pass on Earth. What would happen to human civilization in such a span of time? Might it turn out that the returnee would have to personally rebuild his species from scratch? Would you be willing to look at another galaxy at that cost? If the ship does not return, but simply continues its journey, once it has traveled 8.3 billion light years, the return journey is closed forever. It's amazing. Once you get past 8.3 billion light years because of the expansion of space, the causal link to the solar system will be broken and you'll never be able to return to its neighborhood again, no matter how much you accelerate. But anyway, we are here not to go back, but to answer a naive question. Is it realistic to fly to the edge of the universe at infinite acceleration? When the onboard clock strikes the 200th year of flight, the rest of the universe will have traveled 10 to the 41st degree of years. That's one with 41 zeros. At that point, because of the expansion of space, it is statistically quite likely that there are no other particles in the entire observable universe other than the ship itself flying in a completely dark universe. At this stage, the very notion of time dilation loses meaning because we talk about the relativity of time when we can compare the clock on the ship with the clock from where we flew out. But at this stage of the journey, there is literally nothing else to compare the onboard clock to, not only on Earth, but in the entire observable universe. The ship is the only place where time exists. Outside of it, time no longer exists. The ship cannot reach any spatial edge of the universe because the far reaches of the universe are expanding faster than the speed of light. And no matter how fast we accelerate, we won't even reach the edge of the observable universe, let alone the entire universe. Of course, that's not an answer we're comfortable with. What is cosmology? Completely different from what probably comes to your mind. It's completely different from all the other sciences. The sciences usually take things or phenomena and break them down into smaller and smaller components and then study them, going into ever finer and finer detail. But cosmology is the only science that tries to put all the pieces of the puzzle together into one picture. Cosmology studies the universe, and the universe is not only huge structures like star systems, galaxies and superclusters. It is not only a property of space and time. It is also man and his inner understanding of this universe. Anyone who moves to another country becomes involved in a revolution, goes to war, seeks political power, earns or loses a fortune, marries or does something else of sufficient importance, is influenced by beliefs about the universe. Edward Harrison. And this is true whether we realize it or not. What we believe doesn't feel like a belief to us. We just think the world is the way it is. And the history of cosmology shows that in every era, in every society, people have believed that they have finally discovered the true nature of the universe. But each time, they have only invented a mask to fit the face of the unknowable universe. Will we ever find out what the universe really is? Or will we only think we know each time? If the universe is not what it seems, how can we try to find its edge? The edge of what are we looking for? This is what the universe looked like in the 12th century, in a diagram by the German nun Hildegard of Bingen. 
We've come a long way in our understanding since then. But won't people 1,000 years from now look at our current cosmological model the same way we look at the 12th century model? You might say, why does the universe, whatever it is, have some kind of edge at all? Could it be that it is infinite? The spear argument is an ancient logical argument put forward by the Greek philosopher Archytas of Tarentum, given to prove that the universe must be infinite. It goes like this. What happens to a spear when it is thrown over the outer boundary of the universe? Will the spear bounce or will it pass through, away from this world? If it goes through, then there's something else beyond the boundary. If it bounces back, it means the spear is bounded by a barrier. But that barrier must also be bounded by something else. And that which limits the barrier must also limit something. And so on to infinity. Therefore, the universe is infinite. For more than 2,000 years, the most gifted minds have tried to solve this mystery. And it is safe to say that the riddle of Arithus has largely influenced the history of cosmology. However, what the ancient scientists did not realize was that the universe could be infinite and yet not have an edge or a rib. Everyone knows that the sum of the angles of any triangle is 180 degrees. But in fact, this is not quite true. Back in the 19th century, one of the greatest mathematicians in history, Carl Friedrich Gauss, began to suspect something. Basically, imagine that we, the inhabitants of our spherical planet, were not three-dimensional, but two-dimensional beings. Then our planet would become our cosmos. And in this case, drawing a small triangle on the ground and measuring the sum of its angles with ordinary instruments, we would get the same 180 degrees. But if we were to draw a triangle of enormous dimensions, even with crude tools, we would find that the sum of the angles is not 180 degrees, but more. So Gauss hypothesized that our three-dimensional space might have curvature. In that case, the sum of the angles of a large enough triangle should be noticeably different from 180 degrees. As far as we know, Gauss secretly used surveying instruments to measure the triangle formed by three mountain peaks in Germany and found that the sum of its angles differs from 180 degrees, but it differs within the error, so the results cannot be taken into account. In secret, he did this because, at best, his academic contemporaries would have thought he was crazy. A man seriously trying to find deviations in the sum of the angles of a triangle. At the time, it would have been perceived as if you were trying to find deviations in the answer to 2 plus 2. The same Lobachevsky, despite his status, was hounded for his work on Euclidean geometry. Eventually, Einstein's general theory of relativity, which contradicted Euclidean geometry, was verified by more accurate experiments than Gauss's. It turned out that, in space near the Earth, the angles of a large triangle can add up to 180 degrees. This deviation from Euclidean geometry has to be taken into account today, for example in satellite systems. In other cases, for example, near black holes, the differences between Euclidean and Einstein geometry are already so great that no instruments are needed. Everything is visible to the naked eye because this is actually a straight line. What's the point of all this? The universe on large scales can simply close in on itself, like a sphere. However, with such precise technology, scientists have measured the curvature of space over large distances and found no curvature. That is, locally, near massive objects, the universe is indeed curved. But if you measure it as a whole on large scales, then within the error of measurement, it is flat. And that speaks in favor of its infinity. Theoretical physicist Max Tegmark writes in his book, Our Mathematical Universe, that the number of all possible combinations of particles in our observable universe is about 10 to the 10th to the 118th power. A huge number. But if the universe is infinite, that means that if you draw a straight line from the Earth in any direction through 10 to the 10th to the 118th degree of the diameter of the observable universe, that line will run into the exact same Earth with the exact same observable universe, where your copy is doing and thinking the exact same thing you are currently doing and thinking. This may sound cool, but in reality, if the universe is infinite, it leads to monstrous philosophical implications. Believe me, you wouldn't want to live in an infinite universe. But there are two points here. First, the universe may be closed, but warped on extremely large scales. And we, like Gauss in his day, have inadequate measuring instruments. So our measurements say that the universe is flat to an accuracy of 99.75%. That means that if the universe is not flat, it must be at least 400 times the size of the observable universe. And second, the universe does not necessarily have to be curved to be closed. Take, for example, the surface of a cylinder. 
It is geometrically flat because parallel lines drawn on the surface remain parallel. This is one definition of flatness, and yet it has a finite dimension. The same could be true for the universe. It could be perfectly flat, but at the same time, still is closed. For example, while in a universe that is a four-dimensional sphere, the sum of the angles of a triangle would be greater than 180 degrees, and parallel lines would intersect. In a universe as a four-dimensional torus, none of these things would be true. There, space will appear flat. Nevertheless, moving in a straight line, you will sooner or later return to where you came from. This proves once again that we have very few opportunities to get to the edge of the universe. But we don't stop there. Edward Harrison writes, space and time in most universes of the past were the stage on which the cosmic drama played out. In today's physical universe, however, space and time are the leading actors. Think about it. If space-time is so fundamental, if we think of space-time as what the universe is woven of, then maybe to see the edge of space, just tearing it apart is enough. We know almost nothing about dark energy, which is responsible for the expansion of space, and it's the one that can bring about a sudden apocalypse, tearing the very fabric of reality, forcing us to watch helplessly as the universe around us is torn to shreds. Dark energy is sort of incapable of tearing reliably gravitationally bound objects away from each other. So, it only works in intergalactic space where there's almost no gravitating matter, and this is encouraging, but only on the assumption that dark energy is not something more powerful. Here is this paper authored by physicist Robert Caldwell and his colleagues demonstrating that the era of some cosmic structures may be very short in the history of the universe. Dark energy could lead to what scientists call the Great Divide. What would it look like? First, the largest formations, made up of loosely connected components, will be destroyed. First ominous sign to us will be the disappearance of clusters. But to our dismay, because the speed of light is finite, we'll realize this quite late. By then, the effects of the Great Rift will have already begun to appear in our immediate vicinity. The galaxies in the local Virgo cluster will be moving away from the Milky Way at an accelerating rate. Soon, we will notice that the stars on the outskirts of our galaxy are no longer orbiting in their usual orbits, but are flying apart. Our galaxy will begin to vaporize. The night sky will grow darker and darker. Seven months before the Big Rip, we will see the slow expansion of the orbits of the planets within the solar system. The Earth will move away from the Sun, and the Moon will move away from the Earth. Our planet will begin to sink into darkness and total solitude. By this point, any still intact structure will be increasingly exposed to the expanding space within it. The upper layers of the atmosphere will begin to vaporize. The lithospheric plates will come to chaotic motion due to the change in gravity. One hour before the end, Internal pressure would cause our planet to explode, but some people could survive this moment by recognizing the signs of the impending end of the world and leaving the Earth on a rocket. And the smaller the astronaut capsule, the better. Because when the danger comes from the space itself, it is desirable that this very space and the structure you occupy was as small as possible. But that won't help for long. Soon, the electromagnetic forces that hold together the atoms and molecules that make up the human body will no longer be able to resist the expansion of space. The molecules will disintegrate and all the occupants of the space capsule will be torn from the inside out before they live to see the moment for which we are gathered here. 10 to 20 seconds before the big rip atoms will disintegrate. And finally, the very fabric of space-time itself will be torn apart. It's no use because, first of all, people will absolutely die before they see the rupture. And secondly, although there are different figures, but this catastrophic event, if it happens at all, will happen not earlier than in several tens of billions of years. Whether mankind will live to see those times is a big question. And what does it even mean to tear the fabric of space-time? If space is expanding, then maybe it is expanding into something, into some more multidimensional space. In that case, what if the boundary of the universe is right under our noses and we don't notice it? What if our universe is part of something bigger, some higher dimensions? If so, perhaps we could at least get a glimpse or even a hand in there. And indeed, the main candidate for a theory of everything, namely M-theory, tells us that our universe is a membrane with three spatial and one temporal dimension that exists in hyperspace which has six additional spatial dimensions. It sounds obscure, but even the most respected physicists take this theory very seriously and put a lot of effort into developing it. And according to the theory, all these extra dimensions are right here, all around us. So what's stopping us from getting there? The laws of physics. 
Unfortunately, the atoms and subatomic particles that make up our bodies, the electromagnetic fields, the forces that hold atomic nuclei together, all of this can only exist in our three spatial dimensions. All attempts by some prominent physicists to understand how matter, fields, and forces with higher dimensions might interact have quite specifically concluded that any particles, forces, and fields known to man are bound to our membrane. With a single exception, except for gravity and its associated space-time warps, the flow of gravity into other dimensions explains why gravity seems so weak here compared to other fundamental forces. You have weak magnets not falling off the refrigerator door, even though magnetism is countered by the gravity of an entire planet. In general, if gravity can go into extra dimensions, your hand can. But perhaps there are other kinds of matter fields and forces that can exist in more dimensions. In that case, they could penetrate to us. You've probably seen a demonstration like this before, but for those who haven't, I'll explain. Here, we have a two-dimensional universe inscribed in a higher dimensional space, a three-dimensional space. And in this two-dimensional universe, there is a room in which a two-dimensional person has closed himself and another two-dimensional person cannot get inside. But in the higher dimensional space, there is some object, a cylinder for which there is no restriction to get to the two-dimensional man's house. He will not see the object in its entirety, but he will see a flat section of it. If we transfer this situation to our three-dimensional universe, it may be that in the same way, some four-dimensional object can get to your home. What would that look like? We don't know exactly. The nature of multidimensional phenomena is still unknown to us, but this does not prevent some physicists from speculating. For example, there is a reasonable but only partially justified assumption that if multidimensional fields, forces, and particles exist, we will never be able to see or feel them. That is, if something from hyperspace passes through our membrane, we will not be able to see what it is made of. The sections of that entity would be transparent, but we'll still see something strange. Remember, in M-theory, gravity is the only thing that can propagate through all dimensions. If something from hyperspace has enough gravitational pull, it will bend light rays traveling through it, distorting the image we perceive. If this entity were to rotate, it could engage space in a swirling motion that we could sense and see. In the process of evolution, we evolved in a three-dimensional world, and four-dimensional objects are highly unintuitive things to us. But here's what's interesting. One study examined people's ability to navigate a virtual four-dimensional maze. A special game was used for the experiment. The study demonstrated that the spatial processing mechanism in the human brain has no hard limits to performing computations, only in three-dimensional space. Instead, the results show that after a little training, people are able to begin to navigate quite well in a four-dimensional environment. The human brain is truly a flexible thing. And what is even more amazing is that according to M-theory, hyperspace may contain not only our universe, but other universes as well. And these other universes may also be somewhere very close by. It is assumed that higher dimensions influence our universe in various ways. But so far, human technology has not reached the level where these influences can be measured in physical experiments. In any case, this option too will have to be discarded. What is the use of all these additional measurements, if even hypothetically it is possible to penetrate only from there to here, and not vice versa? Perhaps one of the main messages that Edward Harrison tries to convey in the book is that whether experiments confirm M-theory or not, it will remain a model, a model that may or may not be able to describe certain aspects of our capitalized universe. Because for each person, the universe is something different. For religious people, it is a divinely created world governed by supernatural forces. For artists, it is a refined world revealed by the senses. For academic philosophers, it is the logical world of analytical and synthetic structures. And for scientists, it is the world of controlled observations explained by the forces of nature. And for each, its model can be perceived as a real universe. Because Ptolemy, for example, the great astronomer, his model with a fixed Earth in the center not only explained well the apparent movements of the planets, but also allowed to calculate their position in the future with an accuracy quite sufficient for imperfect observations with the naked eye. For more than 1,000 years, people lived in a universe where the sun revolved around the Earth, and this model worked quite well, quite acceptably described reality. Then in 1500 came Nicolaus Copernicus, presenting his mathematical model of the heliocentric system, which, by the way, worse described the motion of the planets than Ptolemy's model. 
Now we call the Copernican principle the mediocrity of the position of the Earth and the Sun. Our place does not stand out among the rest of the universe. In fact, Copernicus himself placed the Sun not just at some center, but at the center of the universe, which he considered finite and bounded with a dark cosmic sphere in which the fixed stars are embedded. Then Kepler, whose merits as a scientist are hard to overestimate, was simply delighted with Copernicus's idea of the central location of the Sun and refined his model. Do you know why? Because of his theological beliefs. He believed that the Sun corresponded to the Father, so it should be at the center. The sidereal sphere corresponded to the Sun, and the space in between corresponded to the Holy Spirit. His work, Mysterium Cosmographicum, contained a separate large chapter in which the central position of the Sun is harmonized with biblical passages. Edward Harrison writes that each society in its own time creates its own picture of the world, which is like a mask put on the face of the unexplored universe. As you have realized, not only do we have different models of universes today, but there are many different universes and different models of universes. In the very M theory, where our universe is a membrane in hyperspace, other membranes are implied, which are separate universes. In eternal inflation models, there are infinite universes with different parameters. In the model proposed by physicist Lee Smolin, new universes arise in black holes, and so on. Therefore, Harrison says, when we write the grandiose word universe, capitalized, it gives the impression that we know the true nature of the universe. When we call our current model of the universe simply universe capitalized, we forget that this model will suffer the same fate as its predecessors. We often mistake a mask for a face, a model of the universe for the universe. Our ancestors made this mistake all the time, and our descendants are likely to look back in hindsight and see us repeating this mistake since we cannot even in our most ardent imaginations envision the true nature of the universe, we can avoid referring to it by using the more modest word universe with a small letter, Edward Harrison. But can't there come a point when we really do understand everything about the universe? From Harrison's point of view, no. And we are slowly getting closer to answering that question. The edge of the universe is not only where, but when the universe as we know it had its beginning in the Big Bang singularity and therefore has a time like edge. If this universe collapses back into a singularity, it will have two time-like edges, a beginning and an end. These space-like edges of time do not appear to be like rocks or walls, but more like a gradual disappearance. Since time, like space, is physical and part of the physical universe, we can say that physical time is contained within the physical universe and cannot extend outward. So here we have a Big Bang singularity and a Big Contraction singularity. In this model, time can exist only in the interval between them. In general, the problem of existence of cosmological singularity is one of the most serious problems of physical cosmology. The point is that none of our information about what happened after the Big Bang singularity can give us any information about what happened before it. So if a ball flies at you, you almost certainly know what happened before that. You mentally construct a timeline back in time and build a cause and effect relationship. The ball couldn't have come out of nowhere, which means it flew for some time from where it was launched. But all such reasoning doesn't work when talking about singularity. It's the exact opposite. Nothing that happens before the big contraction singularity can give us any information about what happens afterward. Singularities are places where cause and effect relationships are broken. Perhaps the physical world, with its normal sequence of events in space-time, simply dissolves at the beginning and at the end into disordered metric chaos. But in truth, we have a poor understanding of time, such cosmic boundaries. Maybe because we don't understand time itself well, but we don't have to wait for the end of time. The Big Bang and the Big Contraction are not the only places where we can look at the space-time boundary. In fact, we can do it relatively nearby. Even Roger Penrose showed that when a dying star shrinks, there must inevitably be a singularity. That is the point at which the most fundamental things, space and time, come to an end and cease to exist. All we need is one black hole and one Kip Thorne book. Kip Thorne is the man who made Interstellar, the most science-based movie in modern science fiction. Moreover, he is one of the world's foremost experts on Einstein's theory of relativity and is also the winner of the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics. Thorne has a book called Black Holes and Time Warps, Einstein's outrageous legacy in which the word singularity appears 266 times. 
So, strictly speaking, black holes with singularities inside them are not deadly objects, but they are deadly regions, because a singularity is a region in which, in accordance with the laws of the general theory of relativity, the curvature of space-time becomes infinitely large. And space-time itself ceases to exist. That seems very similar to what we've been looking for. Let us finally take a look at this edge, using the mask of the universe called the general theory of relativity. This is where we need all of your attention. This is the difficult part of the video, but if you can get through it, you'll probably realize that you've never heard such details about what's going on in the core of black holes. Here, we'll talk about what's going on inside the singularity itself, the point where the space-time continuum ends. Of course, in terms of how we understand it now. A black hole is a region of space where gravity is so strong that the fabric of space-time warps and closes in on itself, closing off all avenues of escape to the outer universe. Imagine an astronaut falling feet first into a black hole. A small black hole of a few solar masses won't work for us. The diameter of its event horizon will be about 10, 15 kilometers. But at a distance of 150 kilometers from its center, the gravitational forces will increase so much that they will tear the astronaut falling into the black hole in half. Then legs and torso will tear in half once again. Then once more, and so in geometric progression, until the elementary particles do not disintegrate even atoms of which the unfortunate astronaut was made. Thus, the astronaut will not be able to traverse even the event horizon alive, let alone the singularity. But if the black hole is big, that's a different matter. At the center of our galaxy, 27,000 light years away, there's a supermassive black hole called Sagittarius with a mass of over 4 million solar masses. That would be perfect for us. The bigger the black hole, the longer an astronaut can survive. At the center of a black hole with a mass of 10 billion solar masses, an astronaut would fall for another 20 hours. After crossing the event horizon with no discomfort, it would only be one second before the singularity that he would feel his legs and head being stretched out and his torso being compressed at the sides. A few one hundredths of a second before the singularity, the stretching and compression become so intense that the man's bones and soft tissues cannot withstand it. His body ruptures and he dies when what is left of the astronaut reaches the singularity, the expansion and contraction of space becomes infinitely large. And according to the laws of general relativity, the astronaut merges with the singularity and becomes part of it. The astronaut cannot pass through the singularity and come out on the other side of it because, according to the same general theory of relativity, the singularity has no other side. Space and time separately, as well as space-time categories, cease to exist in the singularity. If we imagine the space-time of a black hole as a sheet of paper, the singularity is a sharp edge where this very space-time ends. But unlike paper, on which an ant can crawl to the edge and come back, nothing can come back from the singularity. Astronauts, particles, waves, anything that enters it, according to the laws of Einstein's theory of gravity, is instantly annihilated. But Thorne writes that from this illustration, the mechanism of destruction does not become fully clear, because the drawing ignores the curvature of space. In fact, when the astronaut's body reaches the singularity, it stretches far from the delicate curvature shown in the image. It actually stretches in length to infinity and shrinks in width to size zero. You can imagine the astronaut's body becoming infinitely long, yet his head does not stick out from behind the event horizon. The head and legs are pulled into the singularity, but there is infinity between the head and legs, and there is zero width between the left and right hand. Of course, the astronaut is not the only one experiencing the approach to the singularity. According to the Oppenheimer-Snyder equations, all forms of matter, even individual atoms and the electrons, protons and neutrons that make them up, are infinitely stretched and compressed even the quarks that make up protons and neutrons. It all sounds exciting, but highly implausible, because it's one thing to have some infinities in math, and quite another in reality, and physicists too. Whenever they encounter that their equations lead to infinities, they start to doubt them. It is believed that infinity is almost always a sign of error in the equations. Infinite expansion and contraction at the singularity was no exception. So the laws of quantum mechanics, which are not friends with the laws of general relativity, do not agree with this development. Thorne says that quantum mechanics forbids the existence of any kind of infinity. Very close to the singularity, something happens that we very poorly understand. Namely, the laws of quantum mechanics merge with the laws of general relativity and completely change the rules of the game. These new rules are called the laws of quantum gravity. 
Quantum gravity comes into effect when the fluctuations in tidal gravitational forces become so large that they completely deform all objects in 10 minus 43 degrees of a second or even faster. But the fluctuations are not even close to infinite. The astronaut is already dead, his body parts thoroughly jumbled, and the atoms of which he was composed distorted beyond recognition. But nothing is infinite yet. The game continues. And already, somewhere around here, quantum gravity is radically changing the nature of space-time itself. Are you ready for what happens next? Quantum gravity breaks the bond between space and time. It tears space and time away from each other, then destroys time as a concept and destroys the certainty of space. Time ceases to exist. We can no longer say, it happened before, because without time, there is no concept of before and no concept of after. Kip Thorne's quote, with which he tries to make what he says clearer, before the rupture. That is, outside the singularity, space-time resembles a piece of wood saturated with water. In this analogy, wood represents space and water, represents time, and the two categories, wood and water, space and time, are closely intertwined and unified. The singularity and the laws of quantum gravity that govern it are like the fire into which such a wet piece of wood is thrown. The fire vaporizes the water out of the wood and it becomes lonely and unprotected. In a singularity, the laws of quantum gravity destroy time and space is left alone and unprotected. Fire then turns the tree into a foam of flakes and ash. The laws of quantum gravity turn space into a random probabilistic foam. It is this random probabilistic foam that makes up the singularity. And the foam is governed by the laws of quantum gravity. In this foam, space has no definite form. That is no definite curvature or even topology. There is only this or that probability for this or that curvature or topology. For example, within a singularity, there may be a 0.1% probability that the curvature and topology of space has this shape. 0.4% probability that such, and so on. So, you see, it doesn't mean that space spends 0.1% of its time in the first, second, third, or any other form. Because, to repeat, there is no such thing as time inside the singularity. Moreover, since there is no time there, it is completely meaningless to ask whether space takes a second form before or after. It takes a third form. The only question that makes sense about the singularity is what is the probability that space has a first, second, or third form? The answers would be 0 0.1, 0 0.4, and 0.2% respectively. I hope you still have an understanding, because this is what the boundary of the universe looks like, which is what you and I were able to reach in our quest. It's not at all clear how you can visualize such a thing, but that's what math is for, to manipulate things beyond human imagination, and that's one of the possibilities of modern cosmology. It allows us to study the literally unimaginable. You'll say, even if this theory is true, no astronaut falling into a black hole will ever see the boundary of space-time because he would be torn to pieces beforehand. But in fact, according to calculations done in 1991 by Werner, Israel, and Eric Poisson of the University of Alberta and Amos Ori, the chaotic tidal forces inside a black hole weaken with time. For example, if a huge black hole with a mass of 10 billion solar masses had just been born at the center of some galaxy and an astronaut started falling into it, he would be violently ripped apart. But if one prudently waits a few years, the tidal forces surrounding the singularity will have become so mild by then that, unsurprisingly, the astronaut will be able to survive them. Or maybe he won't even feel them at all. The astronaut will get to the very edge of the probabilistic quantum gravity singularity, almost unharmed. This is exactly what was shown in the movie Interstellar before Cooper falls into the Tesseract. It is only at the edge of this singularity when the astronaut comes face to face with the laws of quantum gravity, that he... Actually, we have no idea if he will die or not, because we still have a poor understanding of the laws of quantum gravity and their implications. You will say that we have substituted the concepts of the boundary of the universe for the concept of the boundary of space-time. And that's true. What could be more fundamental than space-time? On the one hand, it seems impossible that there is a finite universe beyond which there is nothing. And it may very well be that our universe does have something outside. And at the same time, it may also be infinite. But on the other hand, math doesn't require anything external. The universe does not need to be some ball floating in the middle of something unknowable. 
From the third and main point of view, absolutely everything depends on what we call the universe in general. If, from your perspective, that means literally all things that can exist, then there can be nothing outside the universe. Because everything that we think is outside, all of that must also be included in the concept of the universe. Even if it's all this formless or unknowable or consisting of absolute nothing, the void, the list goes on. It is still an entity and therefore by definition part of the universe. We can't go to the edge like Dante and Beatrice in the Divine Comedy and look at the universe from a podium. But where does Harrison get this confidence that we will always operate only with models of the universe and never be able to get to its true nature? On the one hand, because no scientific theory can be proven, it can only be disproved, so we can never be sure that we are not putting another mask on the face of an unknown universe. But Harrison's main argument is deeper than that. It is that modern scientific cosmology explores a universe that includes everything physical and excludes everything non-physical. What is physical? It is anything that is measurable and associated with concepts that at least in theory can be disproved. Atoms, galaxies, cells, stars, organisms, planets. These are all physical things belonging to the physical world, but there is something else. We, as physical beings with bodies and brains, are enclosed in this very physical universe, which is measurable. And the physical universe is remarkably successful in explaining how various things work and allows us to control our environment. But it cannot explain mental things like consciousness and self-awareness. They are not measurable. A person who persistently asks where the mind is in the physical world will go from science to science in search of an answer. Biologists will say that life and mind are manifestations of complex physical systems of billions of organized cells, and each cell is an organization of billions of atoms. And if this answer does not satisfy, biologists will probably refer the person to psychologists. But no, two psychologists will give the same answer to this question. One of them, recognizing that they know very little about the physical universe, will recommend a visit to the physicists because they are the ones who deal with fundamental things. But the physicists will either deny the existence of the problem because for many physicists, there is no such thing as something that cannot be measured. Or they will recommend visiting biologists again because such questions are not within their purview. In desperation, a researcher might consider talking to cosmologists because while other scientists may endlessly avoid the mystery, claiming it is not within their area of expertise, cosmologists study the entire universe and the mystery stares them right in the face. What would an expert in the field answer? What would Edward Harrison himself say? Take a look. This is a painting by Escher Moritz Cornelis, the favorite artist of all physicists and mathematicians, his self-portrait to be precise. The artist depicts a mirror ball, in which the artist who depicts the mirror ball is reflected by the artist who depicts the mirror ball, and so on ad infinitum. I think this is a pretty good demonstration for thinking about the concept of infinite regress. An argument about infinite regress is an argument against the theory that leads to that infinite regress. Let's look at a simple example. The statement, everything has a cause, leads to infinite regress, because one can ask ad infinitum, what caused that cause? Thus, if we accept the force of the infinite regress argument, we have to agree that the statement, everything has a cause, is absurd and therefore false. Cosmology is incomplete in a fundamental sense because we don't know where to place ourselves. The cosmologists in our models about the universe. The universe has self-awareness. It contains us intelligent beings, but the physical universe has no self-awareness and it does not contain us as beings with self-awareness. We can attribute the body and brain to the physical universe, which is only a model of the universe, but we cannot attribute our consciousness whatever it is, to a universe intelligible to and studied by our consciousness. If we do that, we get into an endless cycle. Cosmologists study a universe that has cosmologists who study their universe that has cosmologists, and so on to infinity. For the same reason, artists don't paint themselves in the landscapes. They capture. Otherwise, they would have to paint a picture that contains them painting a picture that contains them painting a picture that contains them, and so on. Where in the universe is the place of a cosmologist studying this universe? To solve this riddle, we need to understand the difference between the incomprehensible universe, of which we are certainly a part, and our comprehensible universes, of which we are certainly not a part, which we create to explain our experiences. 
Harrison says it is particularly remarkable that no physical experiment can determine whether an object possesses consciousness. Consciousness is not a property of the physical world and cannot be explained as a physical phenomenon. Some scientists think that consciousness does not exist, or at best, it is a metaphysical illusion. What we can absolutely agree on is that almost certainly the universes of the future will be different from our current vision. However, they will all be anthropometric. In other words, as the ancient Greek philosopher Protagoras said, man is the measure of all things. The way people think determines how they understand their universe. Of course, the universe itself was not created by man, but we have no true concept of what it really is. All we know is that it contains us, the creators of the universes, universes with a small letter. Modern cosmology deals only with a physical model of the universe. It's another mask on the face of the unknown. But what a fantastic mask it is. All the inventive genius of the greatest thinkers in the history of science has been invested in its creation. Is it any wonder that many people, including scientists, when confronted with the grandeur of the physical universe, have mistaken this latest mask for a real face and the physical universe for the universe? Edward Harrison. If you're still skeptical of such claims, if you're not convinced by the anomalies illustrated at the beginning of the video, what do you say to the following? Now, prominent string physicist and theoretical physicist Nima Arkani Hamid is developing a method for calculating interactions between particles using an entirely new approach based on abstract math that doesn't take space-time into account. Examples of concrete physical systems, similar to what we see in the real world, that can be described without any space-time or quantum mechanics have already started to emerge. Nima Arkani Hamen. One could say the man has been engaged in theoretical physics for many years, got worked up and came to the conclusion that space-time is unreal, but he's not the only one who thinks this way. Clifford Johnson says, I think we all have a better understanding of one of the ideas of string theories, that space-time is not something fundamental. C. and Carroll also hastens to speak out on this point. Space-time is real, but not fundamental. Just as the table is real, but not fundamental. It's just a higher level of emergent description and doesn't mean that nothing is real. So, it's sort of not a question of space-time, not existing. But if we really understood what it is made of, it would look like something completely different at a deeper level. So how do we look for the edge of the universe in such circumstances, when even what seems so fundamental can be a mask? Are you still here? Given the complexity of the material, hats off to you. Thank you for watching.